Welcome to the Mind and Matter Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Joe Bauer. Joe is a professor of physiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where his lab studies the molecular mechanisms of aging and metabolism. Our discussion was all about aging and metabolism, and we talked about everything from aging as a phenomenon to what extent is it just this passive response to the forces of entropy? Is our body just sort of accumulating wear and tear over time the same way that your car or something does? Or is aging a more regulated process that's more actively managed by various mechanisms in our body? We talked about the effects of various molecules and drugs that might be involved in aging or might be anti-aging in their effects. That included everything from nicotinamide mononucleotide, or NAD, which is an important molecule involved in human biochemistry and animal biochemistry generally, which you may have heard about. It's getting quite a bit of press these days and is found in various supplements. We talked about sirtuins, a very interesting class of proteins in our bodies that may be involved in the aging process. We talked about things like the the drug rapamycin, which is normally used for, for certain things in medicine, but also may have anti-aging effects that people are starting to study. And we discussed resveratrol, the molecule that's often associated with red wine and may have anti-aging properties. So Joe unpacked all that stuff for us and where our current state of knowledge is with it. We talked about things that can affect the aging process, behavioral interventions that you can take to affect your own aging, uh, namely caloric restriction. We talked about what animal and other studies have shown with respect respect to the effects of calorie restriction on aging, and we got into some of the details there. So if you're interested in the biology of aging and how it works and some of the nuts and bolts of where the current science is around what aging is and how we might be able to actually control it to actually live longer, this will be a really interesting episode to get you up to date on some of the key molecular players there and where the science is today. As always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast, please like, share, or subscribe. You can subscribe to my free weekly Mind and Matter newsletter on Substack. That comes out every week. It contains upcoming episodes, interesting research, and other things that I'm finding on the internet, as well as some other content that I'm producing and just other interesting things that I find and think are worth sharing. That can be found in the link in the episode description or at www.mindandmatter.com. You can also subscribe to the video version of this podcast on YouTube. So if you just Google Mind and Matter podcast or my name on YouTube, you'll find it there. Hey everyone, I want to take just a minute or two to discuss some interesting new tech you can use for blood glucose, that is blood sugar, monitoring. I've discussed blood glucose and the physiological effects of diet on the podcast many times, and I want to share my experience using Levels Health to monitor my blood sugar levels with an easy-to-use app. People with diabetes have to regularly check their blood sugar levels to make sure they stay within a healthy range, but glucose tracking can also be valuable as a tool for non-diabetics and people in good general health. For example, I've used the this levels product on a couple different occasions to understand how different parts of my own diet were impacting my blood sugar levels. I learned that certain foods I was consuming were causing large blood sugar spikes, even in cases where the food didn't contain that much added sugar, and I never would have guessed it. So it actually enabled me to cut certain things from my diet that I wouldn't have otherwise cut out. Different foods cause very different patterns of blood sugar change, at least for me, and I had no idea about this before I actually started tracking it. Levels would also be perfect for anyone who wants to experiment with changing their diet because it would allow you to actually see how dietary changes are impacting your blood glucose levels. It's a blood glucose monitor that you affix to your upper arm. It's really easy and painless, and the Levels app allows you to take readings of your blood sugar throughout the day. One monitoring device lasts for two weeks, which is more than enough time to understand your own physiology with precision. Levels is currently running a closed beta program with a wait list of over 160,000 people, but you can skip to the line and join Levels today in the space beta program by going to the link levels.link slash mind and matter spelled out all one word, which you can also find in the episode description. Even if this is a product you use just once or twice or intermittently as you change your diet, it can provide you with valuable insights into how your diet is impacting your blood glucose levels. So again, check out the link to the levels product in the episode description. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing seven 
75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure. And vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash minded matter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Joe Bauer. <music> Professor Joe Bauer, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you start off by just telling everyone a little bit about yourself, what your lab studies and what your scientific background is? Sure. I am a professor of physiology at the University of Pennsylvania, and my major interest is in aging. So my lab really mostly studies mice and looks at different interventions that might extend lifespan or improve health over the course of the lifespan. Interesting. So we're going to be talking a lot about the biology of aging today. And I thought I'd start out with a pretty broad question that I think speaks to the the way that the average person probably thinks about aging. I, I feel like most people, and certainly myself up until pretty recently, thought of aging the same way that I would probably think about the way that you know uh, a car just gets old and starts to break down, right? It's just sort of a, a consequence of entropy. Little nicks and dings build up over time. The nuts and bolts start to get rusty. And there's just this sort of slow incremental accumulation of damage, and that is aging. And so to what extent is aging this kind of passive process where we're at the mercy of entropy versus a more regulated process where different components of it are actually sort of happening uh, on purpose, so to speak. Well, yeah, there, there certainly is a repair component to it, right? Many of the things that sort of happen by entropy, uh, we have enzymes to go in and, and reverse. And so we're certainly constantly fighting, you know, the, against the entropy. And so there's, you know, much more than just a, a car without, unless you bring in the, the analogy of a mechanic or something coming in and occasionally trying to, uh, to do some maintenance. So there is that aspect to it. Um, but I think, you know, to really get an idea of what's possible, uh, it, it's interesting to look, you know, around the, the rest of nature. And we, when you do that, we find examples of animals where you don't really see this entropy creeping in mm -hmm. things like lobsters and, and giant tortoises um, and bowhead whales, for instance, where we, there's not really much evidence that they're any worse off year to year, right? They do die at some rate, they have a mortality rate and they don't live forever, but there's not much chance in many of those species that we can measure that an older individual is going to die compared to a younger individual in say the next year. Hmm. We also look at things like, you know, the, the cells in your body, right? We think all the cells are breaking down and, and you're getting older, but it, it sometimes is eye-opening to you sort of have this revelation that if you think about the germ cells, right, the reproductive cells, the sperm and egg that made you, you know, they go back to coming from a continuous line of cells through your parents to that sperm and egg and that, and that, and it goes back, you know, to sort of the origin to the first cell, right? There has been a continuous line of cells that has not died, you know, that has been perfectly healthy and capable of producing the next generation every time, you know? And so I think that there's aspects of, of the intuitive view of aging that we can, we can say, you know, don't have to be that way. Interesting. So if you take, um, if you start sampling people from the population, you sample a 20 year old, 
a 40 year old, a 60 year old, a 100 year old, you can say with, with pretty good confidence that the 100 year old has a much higher chance of dying in the next year than the people that are younger. But you're saying that there's other species where that basically isn't true. So you could take a tortoise that's twice as old as another tortoise and they've got about the same probability of death year to year. Yeah. No, that's exactly. And I mean, in some cases, some of the studies that's even looked like you know, the older individuals that were larger, you know, would be more successful at laying eggs and, and actually maybe less likely to die at, at uh, you know, in certain periods of their lifespan. But that there's, you know, we don't have this familiar sort of human-like mortality curve where there's an exponential increase as you get older. And you're, you know, if you if you graph it out, there's like a shoulder at the curve where mm-hmm. all of a sudden this exponential drop off occurs and you have a much greater chance of dying every year. And that, that's just not seen in some species. Interesting. And so how do we start to think about and dissect that, do they have better and more aggressive you know, DNA repair enzymes? Do they have mechanisms inside of their cells that we simply don't have? Do we know at all what accounts for that, that kind of discrepancy between different species? I mean, we don't. There, there are a lot of people working on these types of questions, and in particular, looking at things like, uh, like rockfish, where there's one genus where there are very long-lived and very short-lived members, and, and really trying to draw these contrasts. But it's not... Uh, it hasn't been completely straightforward. Uh, I mean, one thing we do see is that there's better cancer defenses in these long-lived animals. Um, so, uh, for instance, naked mole rats are kind of famous for being kind of the size of a mouse, uh, but living 30 years where a mouse lives two or three. Hmm. Uh, and they basically don't get cancer. <laughs> uh, they have much better uh, mechanisms to suppress a cell that, that turns uh, cancerous. Interesting. And so that's that's still largely mysterious. We really don't know why. Are there even any hints as to what might be going on there? Um, there are. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do them justice in that there's still you know, uh, uh, different competing theories about sort of the extracellular matrix uh, and wh- whether it actually is able to, to prevent cells from acquiring this growth phenotype um, or just the specific enzymes involved, whether the DNA repair is more efficient or they're more prone to you know, form um, a state called senescence, which is one of our cancer suppression mechanisms, right? I mean, you hopefully can kill a tumor cell, but another thing that happens is if the body detects it, a lot of these cells are sort of programmed to go into a non-dividing state called senescence on their own. And that's one of the responses you get to, to toxic insults to cells. And so having you know, a more active senescence engaging mechanisms can also suppress tumors. I see. And, and most people are familiar with the term senile. We talk about, you know, people going senile at some point, which basically means, you know, they're not, they're not quite their old self. Um, and, and they're clearly in, at an advanced age where, uh, where things just aren't running as smoothly as they, they used to in their brain and in their body. Can you talk a little bit more about cellular senescence, define it for us and, and just give people a clear sense of exactly what that is and why why has evolution uh, baked that into animals? Right. So, so it's, it's kind of become a catch-all term, you know, it's, it's a hot button topic, even among researchers, exactly how you define senescence. Um, so it's been observed for a long time that under certain circumstances, um, that particularly if you express an oncogene that, you know, is going to drive tumor genesis is one, one cause. Uh, if you get severe DNA damage that the cell sort of concludes is too much for it to, to overcome. Um, or if you let the, a human cell divide enough times, it will reach a point where the, the telomeres, which are the ends of chromosomes, get too short. Um, and that triggers a DNA damage response. And in all these cases, you, you get a change in the shape of the cell. It kind of enlarges and flattens out and the nucleus changes shape a little bit uh, and it stops dividing. And it stains positive. One of the earlier ways these cells were characterized was this enzyme called beta-galactosidase gets upregulated. And so you can stain them blue in a tissue section. And for a long time, that's kind of the way people defined it. I mean, if you could get these blue cells, they were senescent cells. Uh, but as time's gone on, we've realized that all these different ways to cause them to get senescent you know, may have a little bit different features of those senescent cells that are produced. And sometimes you get what looks like a senescent cell that was actually had repairable DNA damage and recovers and keeps going. And so it, it's, um, it is a little bit contentious to exactly define it. But in general, it is entering a, non, a permanent non-dividing state. I see, I see. And you know, a big, I think a big area of discussion for us, generally speaking, will be just certain aspects of normal cell physiology and how that ties into you know the different nutrients and dietary components that we encounter throughout life and how all of these things intermix. Something that I know that you've studied that you know quite a number of people are talking about now and there's you know 
companies with products focused on uh, this molecule. There's this thing called NAD, and I know it's it's sort of a key player in the whole field of aging biology. So can you tell us what NAD is and what its sort of uh, normal biological role is in our body? Sure. So, I mean, so it's a key player in, in biochemistry, <laughs> just the, the aging application is sort of what's, what's become a hot topic now, but, uh, but this has been something that's, you know, in, in all the biochemistry textbooks, it's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And so it, it is a cofactor that can accept and donate electrons. And so for a lot of the biochemical transformations that you need to get food all the way processed into ATP, which is the chemical energy that your cells use, um, in a lot of those transformations, you need NAD to actually accept the electrons and then donate them at the next step or to another process. Uh, and so it's one of these molecules you can't live without. It's the product of vitamin B3. So it's you know sort of as people were back in the day going through what it took to, you know, to, to be able to survive. This, this is one of the things, vitamin B3, and you need it just, just to make NAD. I see. Yeah, no, I, I remember distinctly learning about uh, NAD, you know, all the way back in middle school and high school biology and how it tied into cellular respiration. So it's this like very, very core component of just the basic biology that runs all of our cells. You said um, that that it has this critical role and it comes from vitamin uh, B3. I suppose that nowadays there aren't many people that are vitamin B3 deficient, but what, what would start to happen to a human body, say, if you became deficient or severely deficient in something like vitamin B3 and your NAD levels weren't where they're supposed to be? Right. So, so if it's severe, um, you get the disease pellagra. And this is actually, you know, curing this disease is sort of intertwined with the discovery of NAD in the first place. So this was a disease that was endemic in the Southern US. And it was characterized by the four Ds, which were uh, dermatitis, dementia, <laughs> and I, of course, missed one and death. Um, sorry, let me... Uh... But, but yeah, but basically, yeah, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> it's, it's really bad sorry, stuff. I took another shot of saying that, but the, it's characterized by the four Ds, which are dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, uh, and death. Yeah, so it <laughs> sounds so this, it this sounds like it's not, not fun. No, uh, and you know, and obviously it demonstrates uh, you know in a very graphic and real way that you, you can't live without NAD. Um, and so, you know, originally this was thought to potentially be an infectious disease, and uh, a guy named Joseph Goldberger spent the better part of his career demonstrating that you could cure it nutritionally and that it really was a a nutritional disorder. And he intersected with a couple of other folks who um, were, had discovered that there was a redox active factor that they could purify from yeast extracts and we're moving toward chemically identifying it and sort of had this uh, convergence of the two fields where it was discovered that nicotinamide and nicotinic acid, which are the two forms of vitamin B3, um, were curative for pellagra and were also producing this redox active nucleotide, which turns out to be NAD. Interesting. And then you know, so NAD has this core core role in some very, very basic and important physiological processes. If you don't have it, you, you will die. You'll get very sick and then you'll eventually die. What happens throughout uh, development and the lifespan to NAD? Do levels go up and down in different phases of life? Does it tend to decrease um, as we age? What do we know there? Uh, it tends to decrease as we age. And so this has been a little bit controversial at times. It's been hard to measure. And then some tissues, it's not so clear it's going down, but we're getting better data now in humans to show that as we've already seen in mice, that that in general, it is going down with age. In fact, there was a, a study that just came out very recently showing pretty convincingly that uh, in, in human muscle tissue, uh, there's a, a, a drop off of NAD levels with age and that that correlates with functional status. Hmm. So, so there's obviously this correlation there and if it's going down with age, you know, it would be very convenient that if you could replenish NAD levels, perhaps that would cause, um, aging to at least slow down or, or perhaps even reverse it. Um, is, is that the case or is NAD decline just sort of a, a marker of other things is, is, is replenishing NAD levels actually able to causally give an animal any improvements? So in an animal, it, it can. So, so this is kind of where we are right now. And so in, in rodent models, we're giving large amounts of NAD precursors. And in many cases, that does turn out to be beneficial. So um, there's a whole a range of examples, but some of the common themes are in heart failure models. Um, you get an improvement in heart function by boosting NAD levels in rodents. Um, in Alzheimer's disease models, uh, you get improved cognition. Uh, and in diabetes, you can improve glucose handling and then insulin sensitivity. 
the question is, you know, right at this moment, you know, how well is this really going to translate to humans? Mm -hmm. So far there are, for some of the indications like insulin sensitivity, um, it's not been that clear that it's going to translate. Some of the human studies have looked much less impressive than the rodent studies, uh, which has raised questions, including whether, you know, whether the dose translation is working because when you have these massive doses in rodents, you're not really willing to, you know, give such enormous doses scaling by body weight to humans. Uh, and, and that's, I think one of the questions of these lower doses that people have sort of deemed safe, <laughs> you know, just, just might not be sufficient to cause the same change in biology that you see. In I, the rodents. See, I see. So if I'm hearing you correctly, when they're doing these experiments in mice, they're, they're, they're being pretty liberal. They're giving them quite high doses of NAD or some precursor to NAD. And then just, you know, for, for ethical reasons and, and for safety and, and just for being conservative in a human clinical trial, you're probably going to tend to start at those lower doses. And so what you're saying is we're maybe not seeing quite the same effects in humans, but that could perhaps mean we just need to use a higher dose. Yeah. And that's one interpretation. Well, and you know, the, the concern there is that the, you know, that the, that the safety limitations might be real as well, right? That, yeah. that you may not be able to go to a mouse-like dose without doing something to your liver, for instance. So with yeah nicotinamide, one of the vitamin B3 forms, you know, about three grams a day, you start to see hepatotoxicity. Uh, and so there is a concern that if you do these massive doses, maybe you'll see the improvements in insulin sensitivity or whatever you were looking for, but you might have liver problems at the same time. So it's, I it's see. A tricky... I, I, we see that in humans, or is that what we see in mice, the hepatotoxicity? Uh, in, in humans with three, oh. about, three, about three grams a day. I see. I see. Now, what about the mice when you're giving them the ultra high doses um, in these experiments? Are they, are they also seeing hepatotoxicity and, you know, it's, it's a mouse experiment. So we just sort of note that, or are they, is it actually not happening in mice? In general, it's, it doesn't seem to be happening. Not every mouse experiment measures that, but, yeah. uh, but, but we've really seen it. And um, it's, it, it's certainly in general, the mice can take much higher doses of things before their livers get in trouble. <laughs> I see. And that might just be a natural consequence of them being small animals with a different metabolic rate or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so what, um, so, so just on the basic topic of NAD, how would one boost NAD levels at, at least a little bit? If it's a vitamin B3 precursor, is there a straight line you can draw between the amount of B3 that you're consuming in your diet and the amount of NAD that'll actually be present in your cells? Um, not quite a straight line. So, and, and this is again, you know, one of the things that's sort of being worked out in real time. So, you know, there's the conventional precursors, nicotinamide and, and nicotinic acid that we're getting a lot of in our diet. You're making it from tryptophan through what's been termed the de novo pathway. That was sort of recognized afterwards that there was this third entry point. Um, very recently, uh, it was discovered that there's also nicotinamide riboside kinase, which allows a partially formed version, nicotinamide riboside, to go into the NAD synthesis pathway, kind of bypassing the early steps. Um, so that was discovered by a guy named Charles Brenner um, in 2004, I believe. And that was sort of the, the first sort of revision to these pathways that had happened in decades and decades uh, and generated a lot of the excitement that we're seeing now, but supplementing because you demonstrated you could use this, this, use this form, nicotinamide riboside, that hadn't really been considered before. And so that, that's what is in most of the, the popular supplements right now and, and what's going into a lot of these rodent studies. And at the same time, some groups have started using nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, which is an intermediate in the synthesis pathway. That's what gets made inside the cell from nicotinamide riboside. Um, and again, bypasses those early steps, which can be energetically problematic and can be rate limiting. Uh, and so with both of these compounds um, in rodents, you can get much more effective boosting of NAD levels. And when they, uh, when they boost NAD in rodents, how long... As, as like a percentage of lifespan, you know, are they giving it for a few weeks or months, like a good, a good solid chunk of the mouse lifespan? And what kind of effects do you see on longevity in, in some of these experiments to do with NAD and rodents? Right. So, so there's, there's only been two longevity experiments done, right? So the vast hmm. majority of NAD in rodents is on different measures of health and disease models where there's lots of positive data. Uh, the first study that was done for lifespan was a really small study starting late in life. Um, and showed a couple of weeks extension, which was statistically significant and sort of mm -hmm. created the dogma that this was going to work. Yeah, I suppose, the, for, I, I suppose for a mouse, right? They're only living, what, 12, 18 months or something like that? Yeah, I mean, typically uh, two to three years. Okay. So a little bit longer than that if they're if it's you know, they're under optimal conditions. Um, so these guys were two years old, I believe, at the time they started the nicotinamide riboside and they lived 
a few weeks longer. And so it was, you know, maybe a few percent of the lifespan, but statistically significant. Um, but then the NIH intervention testing program recently did this. So this is a, a, a large program that was created by the NIA to test people's suggestions for things that might extend lifespan. So nicotinamide riboside was one of those suggestions and this multi-center group did it and they didn't see any, any improvement in lifespan. Hmm. Um, starting from a younger age and with a larger number of animals. Um, and so it's, uh, that's at the moment, that's, that's where it stands. It's unlikely that these are extending lifespan overall. Mm -hmm. And, Maybe. and I suppose, you know, when you get, you know, there's so many like supplements and new products coming out tied to this, this and other stuff, all of the, all of the, the hot molecules in the aging world, I suppose it's just very, very fundamentally difficult to get human clock human clinical trial data on this because it would require you to run an extremely, extremely long and, and difficult trial. Um, with that being said, like what, are, is there anyone attempting to do long-term trials in humans that might measure these types of things to do with longevity? Um, no, there aren't at the moment. I mean, there are many trials starting up and, and, and so not all of them are registered publicly. So there, there may be some, some longer term ones uh, intended, or sometimes people sort of envision extending their trial if it looks positive and, and you're trying to drag it out for these longer term measures. But this is a real problem for, you know, for things that are like this, that are sort of nutraceuticals and aren't, you know, uh, developed by a big pharma company. You know, there's probably, I think the Office of Dietary Supplements is estimating something like 4,000 different supplements available. Huh. And you can imagine it's just impossible to test all of those in a, in a rigorous way. And so it's easy for people to sort of keep pointing out again and again, there's not sufficient evidence to recommend this supplement or that supplement, um, but there never will be unless something changes about the system. We'd basically have to switch the military budget and the NIH budget to even hmm. start to approach this. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, what about this, this other group of molecules that I've heard about called sirtuins. What are these things and how do these tie into aging? So sirtuins are, well, maybe just to get into that topic, I should say the other aspect of NAD metabolism we haven't really talked about is it's, um, it has this redox function. That's its sort of primary core function. It's also a co-substrate for some different classes of enzymes. So there are, there are enzymes that actually break NAD down, don't just give it electrons, but break down the backbone as part of their activity. And sirtuins are one of those classes of enzymes. There's a couple others called PARPs and CD38 uh, that, that people study for their, for their own activities. But there's some question about whether when you change NAD levels is part of the reason it's beneficial or harmful because you're changing the activity of these enzymes as well. Interesting. Um, and, and so why have these become like so famous in, in aging biology? So the sirtuins became famous because they were one of the first classes of genes shown to regulate lifespan at all, right? So in, in the 90s, you know, or I think 1988 was the first case where there was an individual longevity gene described by, by Tom Johnson, the gene called age one in, in worms. And so that was sort of the, the moment when people realized that changing one single gene really could control lifespan. It wasn't that you needed to have hundreds of thousands of, you know, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of genes interacting, you know, to, to get a change in overall mm -hmm. longevity, just one gene could do it. And so Cynthia Kenyon discovered DAF2 a little bit after that and sort of reinforced this idea. And then uh, Lenny Garante's lab, so Matt Caberlin and Brian Kennedy were in that lab at the time and uh, came up with sirtuins as something that could control the lifespan of yeast. So that's, that's done by looking at the replicative lifespan by sort of trapping one yeast cell, which is budding and taking away the buds and asking how long it can go, like how many buds can it produce as a lifespan. And sirtuins could you know, improve that lifespan. And so they were probably the third set of genes sort of shown to control lifespan in, in any organism. Hmm. And I mean, yeast, flies, worms, mice, what, what are in, in any model organisms that people work with, what, what to this, uh, to date have been some of the most dramatic life extension results? Like, are you, is anyone able to tweak one of these things and improve lifespan by 10% or are people, you know, doubling the lifespan of, of worms and yeast and things like this? Well, with, so I think the most dramatic one is a, is a worm lifespan where the, this age one mutant that Tom Johnson discovered was a partial loss of function. And it was thought that if you knocked out the gene completely, it was lethal or that the worms couldn't develop from their juvenile stage. Uh, and it was shown a couple of years ago, well, probably five or 10 years ago now, um, that if you take those complete loss of function worms and wait long enough, they do develop into adults and they live 10 times longer than normal. Wow. So you get worms that live almost half a year. Which and is, and is, uh, so what, what, what was that gene doing? 
uh, it's in the insulin signaling pathway. And so the, that's a general theme, especially in model organisms, that, that disrupting insulin signaling seems to extend lifespan. Interesting. And that makes in terms of mammals that tends to carry over. So the, the insulin and the IGF one, which insulin like growth factor one pathways um, overlap a lot they, they can um, activate each other's receptors at a certain level. And a lot of the downstream signaling components are the same. And so in mice and in humans, it looks like there's more evidence probably that IGF one pathway disruption is maybe beneficial for longevity, but in those organisms. Yeah, insulin signaling in general seems to be. I see. And could you just could you just give us a sort of insulin one hundred and one here? What is the basic biology of insulin? What is its normal physiological role? And how does you know from there we can probably build on some some of it further? Right. I mean, so so insulin's the you know, the primary hormone regulating glucose metabolism, right? So if you if your glucose levels go up, um, you have a corresponding rise in insulin, and that and sort of instructs cells to start taking up glucose and restores normal normal blood sugar levels. And so diabetics, you know, e- either um, have become terribly resistant to insulin, so it's not functioning well enough, and their blood sugar gets out of control, uh, or type one diabetics can't produce the insulin in the first place, and and, and so have the same effect. Um, IGF-1 is in the growth hormone signaling axis. Um, and so, so growth hormone causes the liver to release IGF-1, and that tends to you know, have an anabolic effect overall. But inside the cell, so like I said, both of them kind of interact on the same receptors and inside the cell, they tend to activate the same signaling cascades. And so it's, it's still kind of a mystery in biology of, you know, why, how, how these things are partitioned, like why, why does it seem like these two hormones can have slightly different effects through the same receptors in some cases or, or similar looking receptors, and then hitting the same downstream pathways. Interesting. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, insulin's obviously involved in diabetes and, and, and other, just other, other metabolic stuff. I've also heard more, um, in different ways about this thing called mTOR. And I know that's really important for metabolism, but how does that start to tie into this? Right. So, so that is one of the direct downstream effectors of both of those pathways, right? So there's, there's a direct sort of kinase cascade that goes through a bunch of steps, but, but mTOR is directly downstream. So when you, when you stimulate insulin, you'll activate mTOR or, or IGF-1. Um, and so that whole axis, I think, is probably the, you know, the, thematically the, the area where there's been the most sort of success and consistency in, in regulating lifespan is this growth hormone to IGF-1 uh, to mTOR axis, which line up a lot of the interventions in. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. So these things are sort of all tied together in some of these key molecular pathways that have to do with metabolism. And obviously metabolism and, and aging are going to kind of go hand in hand in many ways. Um, mTOR... Right, I'm not. I'm not going to remember the full name, but it's something like target of rapamycin. This other drug, mechanistic target of rapamycin. So it, it's changed names a few times because it was violating some naming conventions. But that that's the current standard. <laughs> I see. And what is what is rapamycin? This drug that can affect mTOR? Because I know that there's been some interesting results to do with rapamycin um, fairly recently. Yeah. So, so rapamycin has been the drug that's been the, the most consistent for lifespan extension and it is an inhibitor of it. So mTOR is actually in two different complexes. So to the history of it was that rapamycin was known first, you know, and it was having, it was actually discovered as an antifungal, but then realized to sort of suppress growth in all kinds of cells and through, you know, the pathway just wasn't known for a long time. And uh, again, and Michael Hall discovered in yeast what the target was and named it target of rapamycin. Uh, and then uh, David Sabatini and, and others discovered the mammalian version uh, and named it originally mammalian target of rapamycin, which is how it became mTOR. Mm. Uh, but because of the naming conventions, uh, it was changed to mechanistic target of rapamycin later on. Um, and afterwards, it was discovered that there's another uh, protein complex that uses the same catalytic subunit. So mTOR is actually in two different complexes that have different functions mTOR complex one is the one that's sensitive to rapamycin that people had been studying for a while. And mTOR complex two um, is na- it was named for being insensitive to rapamycin. Uh, there, there's a component of it that actually has insensitive <laughs> in, in its name. Um, but it turns out mTOR complex two also gets inhibited when you treat chronically with rapamycin. Uh, and so actually both of them are probably playing a role in the, in the effects of rapamycin when you treat long-term. So when you activate this mTOR pathway versus when you suppress it, like 
high, high, high level, what are the overall effects? Is one of them sort of growth, promoting metabolism, promoting yeah, no, and, and exactly. one of them? I gotcha. Yeah. mTOR is mTOR, kind of the decision point in the cell. It's a node that decides whether the conditions are right for growth. And so missing a lot of different things, if you're missing amino acids or you're missing growth you know, factor signaling or glucose is low, lots of those things, you can dominantly cut off mTOR signaling and mm -hmm. shut it down. You have to have all of them on you know, to simultaneously to get mTOR to, to turn on and to start activating you know, synthesis of proteins and amino acids and, and, um, and, uh, so yeah, lipids, it's everything you need for growth, essentially. I see. And so the the very simple way that you often learn to think about things like, um, I, I mean, when you think about something like cancer and cell growth, right? Cancer is just sort of runaway cell growth. When you think about growth hormone or anabolic processes that are building up, building up tissue and, and using more metabolic energy to cause more growth, that that tends to be associated with um, growth on the one hand, which can be good, but also, you know, bad stuff like cancer and aging. And then of course, uh, I think people hear a lot about these days, um, the effects of things like dietary restriction. So if you just simply consume lower calories, this seems uh, to my understanding to have certain beneficial effects. How, how does, when we're thinking about rapamycin and mTOR and this sort of really key metabolic uh, molecular machinery here, is, is that sort of a very simple but intuitive way to think about these things, that things that are generally going to be growth promoting will tend to have pro-aging consequences just because you're going to get more oxidative stress and st stuff happening, and then the reverse being true if you sort of slow down those pathways? So yeah, in a, in a general correlative sense, those, those that way of thinking, you know, it tends to hold up. Um, you know, and so for instance, when it was discovered that rapamycin extends lifespan and calorie restriction, we know extends lifespan in model organisms. The thought was, okay, so, so calorie restriction shuts down TOR signaling and this is all one pathway. That hasn't really proven to be true um, mm -hmm. as far as we can. So we, there's a few observations that contradict it. Um, I mean, things like if you just do gene expression profiles and things and just look at how the tissues are behaving under calorie restriction or rapamycin, uh, several attempts to show that they were the same, you know, ended up proving the opposite, that they were, they just looked completely different. And and there's observations like the fact that with rapamycin, you can start very late in life. So the first study that really showed rapamycin would extend lifespan of mice started at about 20 months of age. And you get nearly the full effect on lifespan extension starting at that age, where with calorie restriction, the earlier you start, the better it works. And by 20 months, it's just about too late to get any lifespan extension from calorie restriction. I see. So in rodents, calorie restriction, the earlier, the better. The earlier that, that you uh, restrict the calories the mice are in, uh, ingesting, the longer they're going to live. And then at some point, it becomes too late. But you're saying with rapamycin, no matter when you start giving the mice rapamycin, you get this increase in longevity. What kind of increase were you talking about here? So um, generally, it's been between, you know, around 15% for okay. most of the studies on rapamycin. If you look at the ones where they've optimized the doses and it, and it tends to have a better effect in females, you can get up around 40% with sort of the maximum wow. tolerated dose and, and in the right gender. <laughs> so 15 to 40% of the lifespan. But if, if one could somehow translate that kind of effect to humans, you're, you're talking about decades. Yeah. Interesting. And so what, what else do we know about rapamycin? Um, I vaguely remember learning that it's also immunosuppressant. Does it have any, any other uses like clinically for, for other things? So the two things that it's been used for, I mean, one, one is an immunosuppressant and, it, and it's still used sometimes for, you know, particularly for transplants to, to uh, prevent rejection. Um, it's also been used as an anti-cancer drug. And in most cases, the tumors have developed resistance pretty quickly. And, and so it's kind of been abandoned as the front line for a lot of um, tumor types. Uh, but there is a disease called tuberous sclerosis um, where the primary defect is hyperactivation of the mTOR pathway. And that mm. leads to lots of little tumors. And so in, in that case, it seems pretty effective to target mTOR directly. Um, and so it's you know, kind of in rare tumor types still being used as an anti-cancer drug. I see. Not so, working. so if uh, rapamycin has immunosuppressant effects, you know, under controlled conditions, you can probably you can probably prevent mice from getting sick pretty easily. But could there be could there be consequences to do with that immune suppression to using something like rapamycin, where you know, on the one hand, you're you're seeing this um, this good aging effect, but are you more susceptible to to infection? 
potentially. So the, the mice seem to be, I mean, you are, that's one of the consequences you see is, is more, more infections. Uh, there's also you know, mucous membrane defects that patients on rapamycin get. And so the, the big discussion among people interested in rapamycin for longevity right now is whether you can lower the dose, whether you can change the timing of the dosing regimen to kind of eliminate some of these side effects and still have some potential benefits. And there are studies, for instance, at the Mayo Clinic, they've had an ongoing study with low-dose rapamycin and healthy volunteers. Um, the one major paper that they published that was positive out of that was showing that the, there was an improved response to vaccination among those people. You know, compared to elderly people who were not on rapamycin, you got a, a more robust um, uh, vaccination response for the flu vaccine. Hmm. If Interesting. And so it's actually... No, not uniformly immunosuppressive. It's more people tend to use the term immunomodulatory now. In I see. I see. Maybe bacterial infections, you know, are, are more of a risk. But maybe, you know, particularly if you have a, an older immune system that's a, a little bit senescent, that the rapamycin treatment actually makes it function better. Mm, interesting. I wonder, you know, what what the general, what some of the general connections between immune system activity overall and aging might be. Um, naively, you know, I might, I might think to myself that, um, you know, every time, every time there's an inflammatory event, every time you get an infection or whatever, the immune system has to respond and, and turn on. And, you know, all of these inflammatory processes get instigated. And on the one hand, that's good because it can handle something like a, like a, an infection or, or help heal some kind of tissue damage. On the other hand, whenever this happens, right, you know, too much inflammation from too long can be bad. And there's, there's pretty much always some kind of collateral damage, right? So the immune system very much, uh, it's anthropomorphized. It wants to be turned on when it's needed, but, but, not, but, not when or, but, but not beyond when and where it's needed. So is there some sort of a trade-off between the immune system and the aging side of this where more and more immune system activity would actually promote or accelerate aging just as a natural consequence of, you know, all of the collateral damage that would come from inflammatory stuff happening. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of interest in that idea right now. And and there's certainly good evidence that the immune system does age and that you have sort of senescent and defective immune cells circulating when you're older. There's also this idea of um, clonal hematopoiesis, right? Where the uh, immune cells can apparently acquire mutations that give them a little bit of a growth advantage, uh, whether or not they're functionally you know, do, doing okay. Um, and they can essentially take over uh, a large part of your whole immune system, right? The white, all the white blood cells in your body you know, can be generated from a few clones uh, at some point as you get older. Uh, and that really decreases your, your sort of immune repertoire and your ability to respond to different things. Wow. So, so those cells can take over and your immune system is sort of less diverse. I would also imagine, right, if there's this growth advantage, you know, in some sense, if, if your immune system becomes populated by just the fastest growing and or most aggressive immune cells, that could also be problematic. I mean, even just thinking about, you know, recent COVID events, you know, we know that when people get into trouble, it's often because of this thing called the cytokine storm, which is just your immune system is behaving too aggressively. And, and as it is, are there any trends like that where, where as, as it sounds like almost what you're saying is that throughout the aging process, there's at least the possibility that your immune system is going to become dysfunctional in the sense that it's going to become inappropriately aggressive. Is that known or, or, or characterized at all? Yeah. I mean, I think the general feeling is that it, it becomes active at a low level chronically. I see. I mean, the two things and sort of incapable of mounting the more aggressive response needed, you know, in, in an actual challenge. But so it's, it's sort of that, that juxtaposition of you have little, you know, inflammatory cytokines sort of drifting up in the background, just at your, in your basal state. And that's been termed inflammaging. And it's one of the, one of the key markers people look for is these, the things like IL-6 and TNF alpha that are immune markers that are, that are drifting up as you age, even in the absence of any challenge. Uh, But then when you do have something like COVID, your immune response is much less robust. Mm -hmm. And so when we study, um, when we study these sort of chronic inflammation processes, especially in animals where we can really dig into it more, um, I'm curious about how things like chronic inflammation and aging generally are affected by things like physical activity. To what extent can you prevent these things from happening by engaging in certain types of physical activity? And to what extent can they actually be reversed? 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I mean, it, and certainly physical activity is one of the best things we know you can do from human studies. And, and quite often, you know, if you find these differences that you can show between young and old animals or, you know, or people, um, if you have an exercised elderly group, you can show that they're actually much closer to the young than to the sedentary mm. old group. Uh, in fact, that's that was uh, just shown for for NAD levels in skeletal muscle recently in this in this study that just came out that they actually did that division and they had they were comparing young, uh, active elderly and inactive elderly and and showed that the decline in NAD was almost mitigated by the exercise. Interesting. And is there anything known about um, you know when we talk about these links between uh, physical activity and exercise and NAD or, or, or any of these kinds of things we might be interested in the context of, of aging and metabolic function. Are there differences? Is it, should we think about physical activity purely in the sense of um, intensity, like how many calories you're burning? Or are there interesting differences that might exist, say, between you know aerobic exercise versus weightlifting or something like that? I mean, it's all of the above, but I think that, you know, the bottom line that comes out of most of the studies where people look at this kind of stuff, uh, intensity data over time, is that just <laughs> that first little bit of exercise makes such a difference compared to doing nothing, mm. <laughs> you know, and, and there's sort of, uh, you know, possibility to, you know, to get more and more benefit as you exercise more and more, but, but the um, incremental return on more exercise gets less and less as you go. So I think the most important lesson is to do something rather than yeah. nothing. behavior is by far, you know, the biggest problem you can run into here, but there is evidence that, um, you know, for instance, weightlifting can actually um, change the fiber type composition of your muscles, right? And give you more, more glycolytic fibers that tend to be less efficient. And so can be a little better actually long-term for controlling weight. And so that point gets made sometimes that endurance exercise, you know, while it causes you to burn calories while you're doing it fairly effectively is also training your muscles to be very efficient. <laughs> mm. And so there's this discussion sometimes of whether the real, the better strategy is to sort of generate, you know, powerful, inefficient muscles. If you really I see. So, so, if, <laughs> so if you're doing uh, heavier weightlifting, when you say that you're building inefficient muscles, you mean that they are just burning energy faster to maintain themselves. And therefore the same amount of calories ingested would, uh, would, would lead to uh, less of a buildup of fat storage. Yeah. And those muscles, I mean, fast twitch fibers, right? The most powerful muscles are, are generally glycolytic, right? So there's a lot more glucose that's just being converted to lactate and spit out by those muscles compared to slow twitch for endurance. It's typically the mitochondria there. So you're completely burning the fuel inside the muscle and generate a lot more ATP for, mm -hmm. you know, for one of those that goes in. Interesting. So, so one of the key takeaways that I just heard from you is one of the single best things one can do here in terms of physical activity is not be sedentary. So just work out somewhat and doesn't matter not that it doesn't matter how hard or how much you're working out, but just not being sedentary is, is the first key step. But I wonder, you know, if we could define for people, what exactly does that mean? Um, you know, it, it's probably not most people, most people that are sedentary aren't literally sitting and not moving all hours of the day. And, you know, what, what counts as sort of that threshold of exercise? Is it really breaking a sweat um, is it just getting up and casually walking around the block? Where do we start to think about where that line is? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, so the, I mean, this is not really my clinical area, so I, don't, I hope I'm not stepping on anyone's toes, but the, you know, from, from these studies that I've read, um, typically, yeah, as much as sort of 15 minutes of a brisk walk in a week, you know, you may have a resolvable difference in, in terms of overall health compared to someone who just never does any deliberate exercise. Interesting. Okay. So, so it can, it can really be that simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any, any amount of, of deliberate exercise, I think is, is going to produce a benefit compared to just uh, trusting that the amount you naturally walk around the house or something like that <laughs> is enough. I think, I think that's that little bit of extra effort. Interesting. Um, I want to dwell on co diet stuff for a little while. So I, I want to talk about specific things that, that, that are in uh, different items we consume that, have at least been talked about as being connected to aging, but maybe let's just start with caloric restriction. So at, at a very basic level, I mean, everyone understands what caloric restriction means. It means you're just ingesting fewer calories, but what are some of the basic metabolic consequences of doing that? And how does that tie into some of the aging related observations to do with caloric restriction? Yeah. Well, so yeah, it keeps your 
blood sugar down. I mean, it, it definitely shifts your body composition. So fat mass, I mean, as a percentage of body weight is, is always much lower you know, in people that are calorie restricted. Um, and it was lowers, you know, cholesterol, triglycerides, circulating lipid levels are, are much lower. And so that's what has been done in humans. I mean, we, we don't have long-term controlled um, studies of calorie restriction for lifespan, but we do have all these biomarkers that predict cardiovascular health and, and certainly you know, diabetes or tendency towards diabetes that, that resolve dramatically when people are on a calorie restriction regimen for a couple of years. And that's in humans generally about 25% reduction in, in the calories required to maintain body weight initially. I see. So, so when we talk about that, that was basically going to be my next question. Like what, what is calorie restriction? Is it a, is a 25% decrease one day per week? Is this something that you, that we think about persistently um, when people do these experiments in animals, what is sort of the spectrum of, of restrictions that get used where you see some kind of effect on aging? Right. So, so what's, what's been accepted as sort of the standard protocol for animals in the field is a 40% reduction in calories, uh, maintaining adequate vitamins and minerals. And so uh, you would, and that's done daily. So you have a control group where you're measuring their food intake and the next day, the calorie restricted group gets 60% of what that control group ate. Mm. With, again, knowing approximately what that's going to be, typically you would have supplemented the vitamins and minerals. So they're getting a full hundred percent dose of those, but the, the caloric content of the diet is 60% lower or sorry, 40% lower to make, to get you at 60% of normal. And I'm going to do my best here to try and connect like animal studies to what a human might expect here. But, you know, I think if you were talking to the average person eating the average, uh, what we'll just call American Western diet. Certainly, we're getting a lot of calories, um, and I could imagine that uh, a forty percent reduction in calories is still perfectly manageable amount of food that that one is getting. Um, are the when people do the mouse experiments? Would you say that the the mice that are eating the full diet are having uh, just enough of what they need as a mouse to stay alive, or are they ha are they having quite large diets? Is that forty percent reduction taking you down to something where it's like? Oh, oh, oh wow! I'm I'm really eating a lot less, and I'm constantly going to feel hungry and wish I had more. Or is it uh, what you might call a manageable amount of calories? No, well, so for the mice, it's definitely taking them into a range where they constantly wish they had more. And so, in fact, when I you see. give them that fifty percent of normal daily calories, they eat it within three to four hours. Mm. And so they, they just keep eating until it's gone. <laughs> so they're definitely ready for more food um, at that point. But it is a huge question you know, of how do we translate this observation because that control group that's eating whatever they want, you know, is in a mouse colony where they've been bred to be sort of fat and lazy. Yeah. And things have been tweaked to sort of ensure optimal reproductive success, right? That's the measure of how healthy your mouse colony is, is how fast do the pups come out, you know, for the uh -huh. next generation. And so a lot of the laboratory strains we have, you know, appear kind of obese compared to wild type caught mice, right? If you just went out in, in, in a field and, and caught some mice, they're much leaner and they eat much less than mm -hmm. the ones that we have in the lab. And there's also um, a distinction to be made between the metabolic consequences within cells of calorie restriction per se versus the behavioral consequences. So as someone who, you know, for five years, I worked um, in a mouse lab where we were studying uh, neuro neuroscience stuff to do with feeding behavior. So I worked with a lot of food restricted mice. One of the first things you notice about a mouse that's food restricted is they really want to eat. And so they are constantly moving and searching and digging for food. So how much of the consequences of calorie restriction have to do with the uh, the, the underlying met, met, metabolic shifts per se versus the fact that the organism is now just more active? Yeah, no, that's a that's another thing that's been hard to control for, and you know, and it, it's kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people too. They assume if you're short on calories, you're just going to huddle in the corner right, and try to conserve energy as much as possible. But but like you said, what they actually do is forage for food all the time. <laughs> They're moving around. Um, so what I can tell you is that. You know, people have done side-by-side -side comparisons of calorie restriction and exercise, mm. or even combinations of both. Um, and for sure, calorie restricting. So, so if you set this experiment up um, in order where you exercise one group and don't exercise the other group, and then calorie restrict a third group till the body weight matches the exercising group, the calorie restricted ones live longer. I see. <laughs> 
And so, yeah, so, so I don't think physical activity alone can explain the benefit that you're seeing, but it's, it's, a, yeah, it's definitely a complicating factor. Mm-hmm. And just to tie a couple of these threads together now, you know, I imagine that when calorie restriction is done, it, it has an effect on some of those mTOR, mTOR pathways and insulin pathways that we were speaking up about before. So what does that look like? It's not as dramatic as, as you might think, right? Hmm. I mean, I think I've done some of these experiments looking at TOR signaling in calorie restriction, expecting it to be just shut off, right? Look, to look like rapamycin treatment. Um, and it definitely doesn't. I mean, in general, the TOR signaling pathways are down a little bit in the calorie restricted animals, uh, but it's, uh, they, they tend to adapt. You know, a lot of these sort of signaling pathways, when you first change energy intake, seem to swing wildly. And there's another one that we look at a lot called AMPK, which is AMPK activated protein kinase. That's a typical energy sensor that detects when ATP levels drop. And when you start calorie restricting animals, you'll see that signal pathway come on. That's one of the pathways that shuts down TOR signaling. You can see TOR pathway drop a little bit at first, but as the animals have sort of chronically adapted to these situations, the AMPK signal goes away and the TOR signals not not so far off of of a normal wild type mice. What about, um, well, there's, there's at least one compound I will ask about but before I get to that. Um, obviously people are always interested. I mean, diets, diets are very popular. It's a very huge industry. Everyone's constantly interested in losing weight and, and taking care of themselves. What are, if any, the things that, um, are found in diet that people can consume if they're eating the right foods or taking the right supplements Supplements that have the, the clearest connection to aging and reducing aging. What, you know, if, you had, if you had to list a few things, if those things exist, what are they and what are they actually doing inside of our bodies? Yeah, no, I'm not sure there's a perfect answer to that other than, you know, whole fruits and vegetables. I, th- I think, you know, there's, there's, a, a, there's a disappointing amount of like what was sort of common sense knowledge all along that is, is the best advice we can still give. Yeah. You know, certainly people that eat a lot of, you know, whole foods and, and particularly fruits and vegetables, um, you know, do measurably better. I think there's a good argument to avoid trans fats and, you know, and fructose. I see. In particular. Um but as far as naming, you know, why those fruits and vegetables turn out to be so good for you, it, it's still really hard. You know, the, the thought was always that it was the antioxidant vitamins, right? A, C, and E. Um, and, you know, based on that philosophy, the whole industry sprung up around supplementing those vitamins. And mm-hmm. if you look now at the meta-analyses looking back, there's almost no benefit from massive doses of antioxidant vitamins. Um, but the fruit and vegetable data still hold, you know? So, so I think we just don't know exactly which of those molecules in there really is responsible. Interesting. And, and I've heard, I've heard that findings like this have been seen before, although, although I'm not familiar with the literature myself where, um, you know, essentially the experiment would be in a rodent. Um, you give two rodents the same diet, basically they're going to consume the same number of calories and the same uh, a menu of nutrients but one of them is getting those nutrients through supplementation and the other one is getting it just through the the actual composition of the diverse diet it's given and you tend to see that the the latter mouse is healthier right the one getting everything from like the the basically the whole food diet is doing better in terms of overall measures of health than the one that's getting the same amount of calories and the same nutrients but through the the sort of individual supplements is that is, is there any validity, validity to that? So I, yeah, I'm not sure I can off the top of my head, think of a, you know, a really carefully controlled study making that point, but I think that's consistent with what I would expect and, and consistent with some of the human data suggesting, yeah, that the, the taking the supplements is not as effective as, you know, as having these things in, in food form. Mm-hmm. And is there, um, is there any deep reason for that? So for example, is it because, you know, our bodies evolved to extract calories and nutrients from, you know, complex food matrices from, you know, you know, actual pieces of organic material that we find in our environment. And we're sort of not, our metabolism is really not built for in an evolutionary sense, you know, sucking up single nutrients one at a time in this, in this highly purified form. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's just the, the vitamin D calcium connection, right? There's definitely combinations of nutrients that we might take up more effectively when they're together. And there's certainly, you know, your body knows when you've eaten, right? There's all kinds of hormones being released and the stimulation of gut motility and things that all kind of work mm-hmm. together, 
you know, and so that stuff arrives, you know, in, in the conditions it's expected in the combination of nutrients it's expected in. And so I, I think that's a, you know, an extraordinarily complex area of biology and we, we don't know a lot of the specifics, you know, as far as where this applies, but I, I think it, it certainly does, you know, to a lot of these nutrients. So there's another, um, molecule it's pretty pretty famous in this in this realm and it's the one that's always associated with red wine so i suspect you know what i'm talking about and what is what is this molecule and what, what do we actually know about what it does okay so that's resveratrol right which i actually did my postdoc studies on that um, and published one of the studies in mice that that got a lot of attention initially um so this is a molecule that um I mean, it was known for a long time, but uh, came to the attention of researchers through a screen for things that would activate one of the sirtuin enzymes. Uh, and so the idea was just to, you know, to blow through a bunch of small molecules and see if you could find something that would make uh, uh, SIRT1, which is the the human or the mammalian sirtuin enzyme that looks the most like the yeast enzyme that was associated with longevity. So it took the mammalian form. It was you know, screened against a whole library, and resveratrol came out as the top hit that seemed to activate it the most. And so the work I was involved in at the time was that it had already been shown in that initial screen afterwards that you could also extend the lifespan of yeast with the resveratrol treatment as, as hoped that if it was an activating the sirtuin enzymes and the controlled lifespan in yeast. So my project in the lab, uh, David Seclair's lab at that time was to feed it to mice and, and see if it would also extend lifespan in mice. And so what we found was that in obese mice so fed a high fat diet and made obese, they actually would normally have a shorter lifespan and the resveratrol treatment improved their insulin sensitivity. It had really potent anti-diabetic effects. It drastically improved uh, their fatty liver phenotypes that they developed and it prevented that shortening of lifespan. So they still had a normal lifespan despite being obese on the resveratrol treatment. In mice fed a normal chow diet, instead of that unhealthy diet, it had no effect on lifespan. Hmm. And so we published those results and you know, part of the reason you're probably hearing about this more and more lately is right, there, there's been a lot of controversies along the way in the field, right? So at multiple levels, right? Whether sirtuin enzymes really are involved in controlling lifespan at all outside of yeast, or even outside of that particular replicative lifespan model in yeast where it was originally discovered. Um, it, there's just, at this point, labs with conflicting data published in worms and flies showing that sirtuins do or don't extend lifespan in those organisms. Uh, in mice, at least ex you know, overexpressing SIRT1 in the whole body, which happened later on after our study, uh, didn't extend lifespan, which is still consistent with the idea that we, we also didn't see with resveratrol treatment, uh, any extension of lifespan in the mice fed a normal diet. Uh, and then the next thing that, that became controversial was the assay used to find resveratrol in the first place. So sort of after all this was in progress, a couple of other groups showed that, in fact, resveratrol is interacting with a sort of tag that was introduced to make this assay work for SIRT1, mm. but it was part of the natural system. And so maybe the, the whole thing was an artifact. And that's gone back and forth a little bit. Some publications from the Sinclair Lab have shown that, depending on what substrate you use, it may work with some of the natural substrates. You may, the assay may work and that, that artificial tag on one substrate may have actually mimicked what some other substrates actually looked like. Uh, but that's sort of, a, again, a, an agree to disagree at this point in the field. <laughs> um, and it's clear, you know, that, that for the original substrate that was used in that, art, in, in that assay that discovered resveratrol being an activator of SIRT1, if you take the tag off, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so there's, you know, it's not nearly as straightforward as it first appeared. Mm -hmm. So uh, stepping back and just taking a little bit more of a bird's eye view, there, I mean, there has been a lot of people, I mean, obviously since for, for, for forever, people have always been interested in, in finding the so-called fountain of youth. Um, you know, no one wants to get old and no one wants to, to age and have their body break down or anything. But it feels like in, in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of very prominent people, scientists included, that have been talking about the possibility that we can not only slow down aging, but potentially even reverse it. And there's very, it seems like credible people talking about humans potentially at some point, once we figure out enough, you know, living for hundreds of years and there's startups popping up that are that are extremely well funded. 
how how much of this is hype because of the normal human want for this type of thing and how much of how much of how much are we really learning about aging the last couple of years that gives credence to the idea that we could significantly improve human lifespans and potentially achieve this within the lifetime of someone like you or me yeah i mean I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything out there that you can cite to say that that's necessarily going to be possible. What we can't do is disprove it either. And, you know, I feel like what's changed more so is the mindset of some people to like, instead of, you know, boring the public by saying, we don't know, we don't know, you know, do we kind of present a vision of what might be out there? And, and I, yeah, in that sense, I agree with it. I think, I think we don't actually understand fundamentally what aging is. You know, there's this idea that it was maybe caused by free radical damage and, you know, just sort of metabolism over time is causing damage and we weren't repairing it fast enough. And, and that that's not held up right? in the mouse models where you disable their ability to sort of repair or prevent, you know, uh, detoxify free radicals. Those mice, you know, don't really have the expected effects on lifespan and, and, this sort of the only real mechanistic theory on why we're aging in the first place, I feel like, you know, it is wrong and <laughs> we don't have a replacement. <laughs> and and so, so I think, you know, these types of sort of aspirational statements, I think, you know, I hope are a rallying cry to kind of get to the point where we understand what it is, like what's really limiting. <laughs> I see. So hold on. I just want to make sure I got that right. You're, you're basically saying an, an oxidative damage, it's pretty intuitive, right? There's free radicals that form as a consequence of normal metabolism all the time. Free radicals are just highly reactive molecules, and they just sort of literally rip things apart inside of our cells. And so it makes sense. Like that's physical damage that's happening. Of, of course, that must be related to um, aging and things breaking down sometime. But, but you're saying that if you disable in a rodent model, if you disable their ability to make repairs to this oxidative damage, this oxidative stress that happens, it doesn't really have that big of an effect on lifespan. Right. So, so there've been probably wow. 30 models made now where you, you know, increase or decrease the ability to deal with free radicals. And th most of them have marginal or no effect on lifespan. I, I mean, I think the most impressive one is, is superoxide dismutase, right? You think of mitochondria, which are kind of the powerhouse of the cell where a lot of the metabolism is happening are a major source of reactive oxygen species. They produce superoxide and superoxide dismutase is the main enzyme responsible for detoxifying that. And if you make mice heterozygous for that, which was, was done by Arlen Richardson's group, with the intention of proving the free radical theory of aging, right? He made mice that are heterozygous. So they have half as much of this detoxification enzyme. They get way more oxidative stress. They get so much damage to the nuclear DNA that they get more cancer and their lifespan is exactly the same as normal. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, so, but there, there, are, there are more mutations and there is that cancer liability. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not a good thing to, you yeah, know, to have yeah. too much free radical damage, but it it just doesn't uh, appear to be the core cause of aging, right? That right, right, right. Yeah, there must be much more to the story than that. So, what are I mean? I don't know. Can you sketch for us like what are sort of the main what what, mm -hmm. what are sort of the main uh, threads of thinking on what the the major um, the major mechanistic players in aging could be? I mean, one one of them is this oxidative stress idea? But you've just told us. You know, at the very least, it's not it's not the major driver. It seems, at least in mouse models, are there any other are there any other big schools of thought on what the major drivers of aging could be and what kinds of mechanisms are at play? Yeah, well, there's a lot of interest in epigenetic aging now, right? So, mm. I mean, and that's of course tied in with this idea that there are epigenetic clocks where you can look at the methylation signatures on your DNA in different spots and predict how old you are, and maybe you know, even get some insight into how far apart from your chronological age, you know, you, you've gotten based on your, on your health. Um, and so the thought there, as far as aging is that, you know, that there are a lot of epigenetic marks that are controlling gene expression and sort of telling a cell how to be the right type of cell. And that maybe over time, some of those are getting lost. The problem is this is where it's, it's so insidious, right? Trying to get away from the free radical theory, because you want to say that things like free radical damage would cause you to lose those epigenetic marks, but you almost have to bite your tongue and say, try to, you know, you can say that some of them could be lost just due to cell replication, um, which is a reasonable hypothesis. And that, so I think, I think that that is one of the theories that's intact at the moment that, the, that you may just lose some of the epigenetic information that codes cells, how to do their job. Um, and eventually they become a little bit blank, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you get two more of a generic cell phenotype where they don't perform their functions exactly right. Yeah, I would love to dwell on this for a minute. Can can you unpack for people? So 
what is DNA methylation, just for someone who doesn't know what that is? And then what is this idea of an epigenetic clock? And how, because I see products like this all the time. Um, I've seen them in ads targeted at me, right? You, you give a, you know, a, a swab of your saliva or whatever. And apparently this test is going to tell you your biological, uh, your true biological age versus um, uh, your, your calendar age. So, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself, the idea would be, you know, maybe I'm a 34 year old. But from the perspective of my uh, DNA or some other part of my bio- biology, I, I'm actually uh, physiologically like a 40-year-old. What are these clocks and are those things actually accurate? Okay, so let's start with <laughs> start with the factual part. So the, the methylation is, is a mark. It's essentially like a switch that can be placed on, on your DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it can control gene expression and be involved in different signaling processes. But as far as these clocks, it, you know, it's also occurring in parts of your DNA that we, we don't know of any function for, right? In some, case, some cases far from genes, it just certain pieces of your DNA are methylated or not. And the person who came up with, with a lot of this uh, clock dogma in the first place was a guy named Steve Horvath, who's really a, a statistician by training and was looking at these methylation marks and mm-hmm. came up with a combination of them that seemed to be able to predict the chronological age of, of people that the samples were taken from. And he really rigorously proved that statistically without having any real biological insight into why these changes you know, w- would matter. And he has even made the point that many of the ones that he's actually looking at are the ones that are not near genes, not obviously switching genes off or on. It's mm-hmm. really hard to sort of guess at why they would be important or, or his guess is that they're not important, that they're markers of something, right? And not not drivers of whatever this aging process is. But but it started from that basis of just statistically, the, this argument was there and it was really clear that you could predict chronological age for the sample by by reading off all these methylation marks, whether and not just you know that they're all off or all on, but that some go up and some go down with age. And by taking enough of them together, you can get a signature that's pretty reliable for, for what the age is for that particular sample. And so from there, the question has been, can you extend that to, you know, to, to actually say your biological age versus chronological? And that's been much more controversial, right? You can do things that uh, change the way the clock reads out, right? If you set it to, you have this system where you can predict someone's age and you can ask them to say calorie restrict or fast or something, and then measure it again. And it looks like they're a bit younger, but whether that's, truly has any under you know, biological meaning is, is what's really causing all the controversy right now, right? There's some some groups sort of pushing that idea that you've moved the clock so it looks like you're a younger person, therefore you've rejuvenated yourself. And other people saying like, you know, those methylation marks don't mean anything. We have no idea. You know, there's no basis for making that claim. I see. I see. So so in terms of where the science is at right now, you know, if, if I had a clock hanging in my room, um, I could physically go and, and turn the dial back an hour and be like, look, it says it's an hour ago. Um, but it's not clear whether or not I've actually turned back the clock or, or I'm simply fooling myself and, it, and it's still noon instead of 11 a.m. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it may well be, you know, that, that, that time went back an hour. Um, we, you know, we don't know. There's some encouraging data suggesting different interventions like calorie restriction that we know will extend lifespan is also pushing the clock back or slowing it down. Um, and that if you're you know, obese, that, that it looks in general, like it's a little bit accelerated. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, it's by no means disproven that this, this is going to work, mm-hmm. um, but it's not proven yet either. And, and I think definitely uh, you're, you're feeling right now, if you get onto you know, people's Twitter feeds, the pushback, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we haven't proven this yet. You can't, you know, go using it as the, as the readout for health. Mm-hmm. And predictive life. I mean, so based on everything I've, I've heard you say so far, in terms of things that regular people can choose to do or not to do, is it fair to say that probably the single most impactful thing any of us could do that is very likely to extend our lifespan to some extent is caloric restriction. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think that's, you know, that, that's the extreme one, right? I mean, there's, you know, diet and exercise, of course, are the, you know, the, the things basically everyone should be doing. If you were going to take, you know, a stab where you did something drastic, I think calorie restriction has a real good chance. Uh, but again, we, you know, we, we don't have the ultimate effect on lifespan in humans, we only have that we know it will improve your biomarkers, you know, that, that are you know, predicting decreased incidence of many diseases. Mm-hmm. And one more question on calorie restriction that I'm not sure I clearly articulated before is this, you know, I, 
is there a linear effect here? So let's just say, let's just say I'm eating twice as many calories as I probably should. Um, so I'm someone who eats a lot and I'm clearly overeating. If I restrict my calories so that I'm sort of eating the normal recommended amount of calories, is that going to have a beneficial effect versus if I'm eating sort of the, the normal amount, but then I really take it down to something below that. And, and is there, is there a linearity to that relationship or is it, or, or is there a non-linearity? Do I really need to go to, you know, a 40% reduction from what a normal recommend diet recommended diet would be in terms of calorie content in order to see any effect? Right. Uh, no, it, there probably is a linear relationship and, and, and there, you know, at some point there's a, an, an end, you know, to the benefit too. Right. And right, there's going right. to be a point where you drop off a cliff and, and people see that in studies like in flies where you can sort of just restrict them right down to nothing. And you, you see, there's a, you know, a bell curve where less than they wanted uh, is optimal for lifespan, but then clearly there's going to be a point where you're switching into starvation or malnourishment. And, and certainly, you know, if you, you know, take on this calorie restriction idea, you've got to sort of take responsibility for getting all the vitamins and minerals and things too, because right. if you have just that fewer number of calories, but you're completely malnourished because you're spending them on, you know, on white bread or something, you know, you're not going to be in good shape and clear. And, you know, people have looked at the survivors of famines and things where people have essentially had, you know, the, the calories of calorie restriction or less over long periods. And they clearly have health problems afterwards. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to you know, make a commitment and put some effort in to, to not knowingly, you know, do, do something detrimental with that. Um, the other thing I'll say is even in the mice, um, you know, it varies by strain and by gender, you know, wh mm. where that optimal point is. And so there have been some studies done recently where 20% calorie restrictions been compared to 40%. And in some mice, the 20% works much better. And so you can imagine you might already be over the starvation point <laughs> going to 40% as a human. Most of the human studies have been 25%. <laughs> um, and so in these calorie restriction studies, is it always, um, is it always a constant calorie restriction? Like you're taking the mouse and then for the entire span of the study or the span of that mouse's life, it's on this calorie restricted diet, or have you seen, have people seen any benefits from in intermittent calorie restriction? Like if you just take a day, a, a day long or a two day long fast, but you're only doing it for those one or two days and then eating normally outside of that, do you see that similar, the same kind of effect? Yeah. So, so all of the above I mean, people have tried, all kinds of these regimens. I mean, the, the one I described is kind of what was the standard, you know, was the benchmark people measure other things against. But um, for instance, it became quite common to do calorie restriction where you do three meals a week. Um, so it's, you know, 60% per day, but so on Monday and Wednesday, you get two days worth of food. And on Friday, you get three days worth of food, uh, which you can probably imagine is due to technicians not wanting to come in on the weekend. Uh, and it's been shown that you know, taking that approach, you can also get lifespan extension. That looks pretty equivalent to what you get with the, uh, you know, with the daily feeding there, um, one of the oldest regimens is, was every other day feeding. So in parallel to this sort of 60% of calories, people have instead been doing food every second day. Um, and if you measure the food intake of those mice, it depends on strain again, or whether it's mice or rats, but typically they're eating 90% of the calories that the other group is eating. And in, especially in rats that can extend lifespan in some cases more than the, the, the uh, 40% restriction every day. In mice, we've found that the 40% restriction tends to work better than the every other day feeding. Um, I see. I see. It depends. But but in general, if you're calorie restricting with any pattern, there often is some kind of uh, longevity effect that, that you see. Yeah. And, and you know, people have, like I said, tried all different configurations, trying to isolate what the different effects are. And clearly uh, there's a main effect of, of just of, of calorie intake you know, pretty much whatever you do, if it results in a reduction in calorie intake, that can get a benefit. But there also, you know, is accumulating evidence that just just fasting may be enough. That that if you so people do like the every other day feeding regimen where they extend the time with food by a few hours and try to get that last ten percent of calories back into the animals, so they're really eating the same overall calorie intake, but having this big fasting period and still seeing some benefit on hmm. lifespan. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I wonder if, you know, I mean, I'm just speculating at this point. I wonder if that's simply related to the, um, you know, if you think in evolutionary terms, um, you know, animals almost never have perfectly consistent access to food. They're always to some extent going through, through bouts of real hunger and food deprivation and bouts of, of, you know, food intake. Is the body yeah. somehow just expecting that kind of pattern? 
No, yeah, I mean, intuitively, I mean, your metabolism, you know, going from a feeding to fasting transition, you reverse a lot of things about your metabolism. And it can certainly, uh, it makes intuitive sense, I think, yeah, that, that your body would be used to, to having these cycles and that, you know, it, that you know, sort of holding it in the fed state <laughs> indefinitely, you know, could really cause some long-term problems. Hmm. Yeah, it almost, um, it almost reminds me of what you said about being sedentary, where it's like, if you're just not moving all the time, that's the real issue. At least get up and do that sort of 15 minutes of focused exercise to, to switch your body at least that little bit. I mean, it sort of feels like there's an analogy there, right? Like, okay, if, as long as you just take a little bit of time to let your body get hungry, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's better than nothing at all. Yeah, no, I think that's, there's definitely, a, I think maybe an aspect of sort of pressure relief, <laughs> you know, that just needs a little of something like that, like you said. <laughs> So, um, so what is your lab working on right now? What are some of the most interesting questions that you guys are pursuing today? Uh, so the labs mainly focused on, on NAD. Um, there've been a couple of different areas that we've been working in. One of them is, is trying to discover, you know, how NAD gets localized within the cell. So one of the, you know, the issues in this whole field right now is that we know a lot of implementation studies, right? Where you just fill the body with NAD precursors and NAD levels kind of go up and, and we see some benefits sometimes and other times we don't, depending on the system, but we really don't know where in the, well, first of all, which cell types are important for a lot of these effects. And then even within the cell, there's different compartments of NAD, right? It's, it's actually inside enclosed inside many different organelles. And we, we don't really know which organelles are getting more NAD, if it's all of them or if specific ones are responding or responsible for what we see. And so one of the key ones is, is the mitochondria, right? A lot of the mm. key metabolism that's going on and then uh, ATP generation is happening inside the mitochondria and they have an NAD pool inside that's separate from the rest of the cell. And so my lab for a while has sort of been focused on demonstrating that they do take up NAD from the cytosol. So from the surrounding part of the cell, that that's how they get it. They don't make their own or they, at least if they do make their own, in many cases, it's, it's a minor contribution to where they're getting it. They're mainly taking it up from the cytosol and, and sort of identifying the transporter that does that. So we recently did, it was a, an orphan transporter called, just given the systematic name. So it was called SLC 25A51. <laughs> uh, and there was nothing, you know, no scientific literature on this transporter at all, except that it had showed up at a couple of screens as something that was essential. The, the cells would die if you deleted it. Mm. And so we were able to show that that is actually what's mediating the uptake of NAD. And now our labs, you know, engaged in trying to discover, you know, what the consequences of that are. So if we block this pathway so that we then give supplements, but you can't get the NAD into the mitochondria, do they still have any beneficial effect? Ah, I see. <laughs> or if this gene's up or down regulated in the first place, is that doing something? So we see, for instance, if you look in databases of, of tumors, this gene does show up as one of the ones that's predictive of, you know, poor or better outcomes for different tumor types. And in particular, it's, it depends on where, where it comes from, but in the kidney, it stands out that it's actually beneficial if you have high expression of this gene and kidney tumors are kind of famous for relying on glycolysis for not using their mitochondria for mm. energy generation. And so in the kidney, you can imagine if you, if you switch this gene on and you force them to jam all the NAD into the mitochondria and they'd be re re revved up, but the cancers don't like that pathway for growth. They're relying on it, on it working uh, in the cytosol. Uh, you can see maybe that that would actually be a beneficial thing um, you know, to, to rev it up in that type of tumor. But in other tumors, you might want to inhibit the pathway where they really are dependent on their mitochondria. And so we're yeah, really you're looking for applications for this right now and, and, and seeing what basic understanding we can squeeze out of it. Interesting. What are some of the major areas that, that the, the field of aging biology in general is working on right now? Are there one or two sort of big questions where there's a lot of activity and a lot of labs pursuing things aggressively? Yeah. I mean, I, I, so I think the clocks, as we already sort of touched on, I think there's, there's a lot of labs you know, developing new clocks and, and really trying to get you know, more insight into how much biological meaning they really have at the end of the day. Uh, I'd say the other big area is um, senescence. So the, the cells that we touched on earlier. So it's um, again, Jim, Jim Kirkland uh, spent a lot of times looking for compounds that could selectively cause those senescent cells to die and has been pretty successful in identifying some different combinations. And those have actually gone through a series of mouse trials and are already uh, now, now in humans. And yeah, I think it's become a really big question in the field of if you can eliminate all the senescent cells, you know, is that gonna be beneficial for a lifespan? It seems to make mice live longer if you, if you get rid of them. Hmm. And I, I, I just feel like given the subject matter, um, I should ask this kind of question, you know, given who you are and what your expertise is 
and your knowledge of the science here, and obviously your knowledge that, that we all share of what people get exposed to by product marketing. Um, is there anything, you know, is there anything that, that in particular that you or don't do beyond the obvious, making sure that you're eating a healthy diet, making sure that you're getting some exercise. And the thing that we haven't talked about is, is probably relevant here is getting adequate sleep. Is there anything that, that you do that you at least hope or think is likely to have a positive impact on how your body is aging? Are you buying any supplements that you think, you know, the evidence is strong enough that, Hey, it's, it's at least worth a, worth a shot to, to take this stuff. Um, I'm not taking anything consistently. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is still this sort of lack of knowledge. So, I mean, I'm very curious about a lot of the supplements. And so for, I do take nicotine, my riboside at times I've taken resveratrol at times just to, you know, to see if I feel subjectively like I'm getting any benefit. And, and again, just, just because these large scale clinical trials, you know, aren't forthcoming and, and, and there's not going to be another way for me to really know, you know, how, what, what I think about these things. Um, but I would say, yeah, I'm not, I have not committed to, you know, to long-term supplementation with anything at this point. Um, I just, whenever I get on the subject, yeah, do remind myself to eat a little healthier to, you know, to make sure I'm getting that exercise a little more regularly. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I, I, with supplements, I'm, I'm still uh, experimenting a little bit out of curiosity, but not committing. <laughs> Got it. Well, Professor Joe Bauer, we've gone over um, a lot of interesting stuff here. So I want to thank you for your time. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave people with um, on things that you, you think are worth re-emphasizing things that you think people might want to know if they're interested in aging biology or, or even resources that you might point people to if they want to just learn more about the field um, if they're interested? Um, well, one thing I probably uh, didn't work in and maybe should is uh, just to emphasize the, the quit smoking part of living longer. <laughs> that is certainly, you know, the, the one intervention that anyone who's smoking can, can take to, uh, to have a, a more immediate and dramatic effect on, on their pre predicted lifespan than anything else right now. Um, and no, I'm not, uh, yeah, I think other than that, you know, just like I said, I think, uh, you know, to eat healthy, <laughs> make sure you exercise. Like you, you said, get, uh, get good sleep. And, um, yeah, the, I mean, those are really the key things. All right. Well, professor Joe Bauer, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you.